Welcome back to another episode of the Girls Talk Money podcast. If you've been listening to the podcast for a while, you know that Grace and I are both in our mid-20s and have both come such a long way personally and professionally over the past few years. I know for me personally, and Grace, you probably feel the same way, turning 25 a few months ago, I swear, altered something in my brain. I feel a lot older and wiser than I did when I was 24. I'm sure we'll say the same thing the next time we have a birthday as well. But while we're both 25, we wanted to take the opportunity to film this episode with with 25 things that we learned by the age of 25, we definitely won't be able to get to all 25 in this episode because we're both professional yappers, but this will at least be part one of all of the biggest life lessons that have impacted us the most so far in our 20s. You are so accurate on the like something changed in my brain when I turned 25. I feel like we were just having a conversation about this a couple weeks ago too. And I was like, the way that I view the world, the way I view relationships, the way I view friendships, how I like move, like I'm just moving with so much more intention ever since I turned 25. And I only turned, we're filming this like very beginning of July and I only turned 25 in November. I don't know how many months that is, but I just like the, I don't know, so much has changed in the last however many months. It's kind of crazy. I feel like so I'm much more like wise. I totally agree months. with that. I have one very good friend here in Pittsburgh that is a year older than me. So she's 26. And I remember we got together for my 25th birthday. It was like a week before I turned 25. She was like, I am so excited for you to turn 25. She was like, when I had my 25th birthday, I swear, like that whole year was so impactful for me. And I learned so much and I became such a like bigger and like more wise person, I guess. Um, and that has definitely been the case over the last couple of months. I just turned 25 in April, so definitely still newer. But like I said in the intro, I feel like we, over the last couple of years, we've just grown so much um, through like doing social media. You can kind of see how much we've grown and like seeing how much our life has been changing over the last couple of years. So yeah, it's been crazy. Yes. Someone actually messaged me the other day. I won't name their name just in case they don't want their name like named on the podcast, but they will know who they are. And they said that they've been listening to the podcast for a while and that it was so cool to see like our growth because they've been like listening to all the episodes. And I was like, wait, I'm like, that is so sweet. Like I need to go back and listen to the beginning ones just to see some of the things that we had talked about in the first, you know, few episodes now have come true or things that were like, you know, talking about certain mindset things or how we want to work through a mindset thing. And then, you know, now episodes down the line, we actually have done those things, um, which I'm like, oh, so I just, I don't know. I feel like since I turned 25, I've grown so much as a person. Um, so I'm excited to share like in today's episode and like Aaron said, we're going to break this up into a couple parts because we probably <laughs> won't get to all of them in this episode, but um, I'm excited to share like some of our, our biggest learnings. Yeah, it's funny that you say that. I had an in-person event last Sunday and someone actually came up to me and said that too. They were like, I've been listening cool. to the podcast since you guys got started and you sound a lot more confident in the way that you speak and you got, we could tell cool. that you guys have grown so much, which it's only been since November that we started the podcast, which is so awesome that people have noticed and I don't want to go back and listen to the earlier episodes <laughs> because I feel like at this I point know. I'm kind of cringe at that. I know. It's at the like beginning I, do, I was like, these I are don't. so good. <laughs> I know. I remember like the first few that we filmed, it was so awkward, but then we were like, it's better than nothing. Just get it out there, you know? And now it's like, we're so much more casual and yeah, more confident. So I, it's like, I want to go back and listen, but I know I'm going to cringe. I did watch one yeah. of the podcast episodes with someone else before. And he was like, why do you keep nodding so aggressively? And I was like, what do you mean? And he was like, you have not stopped nodding while your friend's speaking the entire time. And I was like, oh my God, I was so embarrassed. I was like, wait, I do that I, too. Like, I think yeah. I still do oh, that like, actually. I, I, I actively tried to do it less but I'll be like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, just because I'm just like listening like intently. But it was like nonstop nodding just like for like a minute and a half. So I don't know. I would love to go back and see how we've grown, but I would love to skip over the cringe bits for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, some of all of this goes into like what we're going to talk about in our life lessons, yeah. at least I know like on my end. So why don't you kick us off with your first life lesson that you learned by age 25? Okay, I'm going to actually skip ahead to the bottom of my list because I think this one is connected to what we were just saying. So I'm going to go out of order. But um, one of the biggest things I feel like I've learned so far in my 20s is that time is going to pass regardless. Like you are going to end up being 30. You're going to end up 40. You're going to end up 50. Would you rather be 40 and have the life that you want or a life you don't want? Or would you rather be 40 and have 
taken the leap to go after building a business that you wanted to, whether it worked out or doesn't work out, whatever, would you rather have tried it or would you rather be 40 and still wondering whether it would work out? I came across this kind of like perspective a couple of years ago when it was in a Facebook group called Not Wasting My 20s. And someone was like, I'm debating going to grad school, but I'm like in my late 20s or early 30s. And they were like, I don't know like if I want to go back. And someone was like, you're going to be like, because they, they were saying something about how they wanted to end up in a certain spot by 35. And they were like, you're going to be 35 anyways. Would you rather be 35 with the degree that you want or 35 without the degree that you want? And something just like clicked in my brain. And I was like, I don't want to end up at a point in my life where I'm looking back and I'm like, well, I ended up in, you know, turning 40, like I knew I would. And I didn't go after any of the things I wanted to because I was afraid of the timeline on which I was doing those. And I think that was a big thing that helped me kind of see my business through when I started it three years ago, because I was like, I would rather give it a go. And if it fails, great. Well, at least I tried it. And now I know, and I'm not sitting here just wondering whether or not it would have worked out for years to come. So yeah, you're going to end up in the same spot. Like you're going to, you're going to age regardless. So use your time wisely and try the things you want to try because you'd rather be that age for the thing that you want or having tried to go after the thing that you want than, you know, not having tried at all. Yeah, 100%. I think people always think that they like miss the boat on a lot of things. You know, it's Mm -hmm. like, oh, well, this person started saving their money at 20 and I'm 26. So it's too late. I'm like never going to be able to catch up. You're only on your own timeline and it's never too late to try literally anything. So yeah, I love that life lesson. The first one kind of on my list, kind of changing gears here is this might be a hot take too, um, but I have definitely thought this way over the last couple of years and it's served me really well. Um, it's okay to let friendships and relationships fade. And when I say relationships, I don't necessarily mean romantic relationships because most people only have one romantic relationship at a time, but relationships <laughs> more so in terms of friendships. Um, it's okay to let those fade away. And that is often what lets better relationships into your life. I think people th- think that in order to let a relationship fade, it needs to be some big blowout with a friend or like it has to, your friendship has to end. You know what I mean? But kind of going into your mid to late twenties, you realize just how sparing your time is and how like you can only give your energy to so many people. And if you're spending your energy on people that like maybe aren't deserving of your energy, then it's going to be really hard to gain new close relationships that could better serve you. Um, So definitely like letting some friendships fade in my life has let in room for more better relationships. And I can honestly say like I have the best friends ever now and I'm very um, particular with who I spend my time and energy on. A hundred percent. I feel like we did an episode on making intentional friendships or something. I don't remember what we called it, but it was towards the beginning of our podcasting journey. Um, So it's probably a cringe fest, but um, (laughs) I talked about it in that episode, how like I, the end of high school, I basically decided to let my friendship go with three girls that I had been close to because it wasn't a giant blow up, I would say, but it was just like, I realized that over the course of our entire friendship, it was always like, there was kind of like one girl was kind of always pitting the others against each other. Um, and just a lot of like making fun of each other. And it was just kind of like, I'm like, what is the point of being in this friendship? And then same thing in early college, I was like friends with two different people who cheated on their boyfriends. And I was like, we clearly do not have the same like value system because neither one of them saw a problem with it. And I just decided to let that friendship fade. And I think a lot of people feel like oh, because I've been friends with this person for so long, I'm obligated to hold on to that friendship. But ultimately, remember, you have very limited resources in terms of time and energy. Like you only have so much time in a day. You only have so much energy. And if you're choosing to put that towards people that aren't like, you know, adding to that energy, that's not giving you back energy or making you, it's not contributing to the betterment of your life in any way. It's really just becoming like an energy suck and a time suck. And I think the, you know, continuing to stay in a friendship or any sort of relationship that you feel like is not good for you for whatever reason, I feel like it's, um, I don't, you're doing yourself a disservice, you know, because I mean, the friends that I've made since allowing friendships to fade are a million times better, like a million times yeah. better. 
when I think of all of the people that wouldn't currently be in my life if I didn't let Mm -hmm. prior friendships fade. And that is like a major life lesson and something that I will continue to do moving forward in my life. Um, Even with friends that haven't necessarily been your lifelong friends, you can still get some guilt around not putting energy into it and feeling like, oh, you're letting letting a, a friendship go or anything like that. But yeah, you only have so much time in the day, so you can't prioritize everyone. Yeah. My next lesson on the list actually goes well goes with this so well. Um, so I'll share this one, but it's one of the most important decisions you can make is choosing to surround yourself with people that are better than you. Now, this is what I mean by this. Okay. There's that, <laughs> you know, quote. I feel like I have to explain. I'm not okay. I feel like, I mean, there's that quote that's like, you're like the product of the three people you spend the most time with. I don't know how it goes, but one of the things that I started doing in the beginning of my 20s that looking back and like that was so immensely helpful and I think helped like drive my career forward, helped me like learn things faster, figure things out faster is that I actively tried to put myself in positions where I could communicate with people who were better at at something than me. So like people who had way more experience as an entrepreneur, people who had um, a different experience in marketing, someone who is in like an entirely different field from me, someone who is like, you know, they're a much better runner than I am and I'm going to try to run with them or, you know what I mean? Just people who have different skills and talents than you. Um, Because I feel like that has been one of the main ways that I've learned things post-grad. People always ask me, oh, how did you learn a lot of the things in your business? And I'm like, I definitely spent a lot of time Googling and watching YouTube tutorials and all of those things. But I also made a point to try to land clients that are way smarter than me and then asking them questions or being really observant of how they talk about things and how they make decisions and how they just like interact with their team and all those things because you learn so much. I remember one of my clients I had in the beginning, um, I was doing some blog work, but I wasn't very familiar about SEO, which is search engine optimization. And I knew my client had a call with this SEO contractor that he had hired. And I was like, hey, do you mind if I just attend this call and like I'm not gonna charge you for the time that I'm there. I just I'll just come and turn my camera off and just listen in just so I can learn. He was like, yeah, absolutely. And I sat there on this like 30 minute to an hour call and I just listened to this guy talk about SEO and explain it to my client. And I learned so much from that. And then I took what I learned and come to find out my client was like, hey, can you help us with this? I know you were on that call and like you got the same background I did. Can you actually implement these things? So it ended up benefiting my business, but I was doing it just to learn. Um, and I think this also goes for your friendships. It's not just about business. Like I was just telling someone the other day, most of my friends that I talk to super often are people I've never met in person. <laughs> like I was just sending voice notes back and forth with my friend, Kate. We've been talking. We're so close. We've been great friends for the past year, year and a half. I've never met her in person. Not once. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like a lot of my friends, that's the case. They're people I've met through social media. I've met through business coaching programs, networking groups, things like that. But they're other people that are like, you know, they're really inspiring entrepreneurs, people who have different skills and talents than I do. And I genuinely think that when you surround yourself with people like that, the energy rubs off on you and you just like, you feel better, you learn more, you perform better. You just feel more motivated. Like seeing all these people do these inspiring things is so inspiring to me. So being really, really intentional about who you surround yourself with. And also one other like note on this is that I think one of the things I've tried to be intentional about, especially the last like year, year and a half is like people whose energy, I'm a very positive person. That's the kind of person I want to be. I've actively worked on that for the last couple of years because I used to be somebody who would get frustrated really fast. And now I'm like one of the most patient people I know because I've literally like talk about it in therapy. I like work on it every single day, being a more patient person and being like just a positive person. And so I try to limit my time around people who are more negative people. And that means some, that meant that I let go of some friendships or some relationships, like with certain acquaintances and things, because every time I'd have a conversation with them, it was just like, oh, the world sucks and people suck and this, that. And I was like, okay, this is not, you know, 
<laughs> how I want this to go or what, what I want to be talking about, the energy I want to feel. But be really, really smart and intentional about how who you surround yourself with and how you're spending time with them um, because I think it definitely impacts your energy for sure. 100%. I think on the friendship side, there's two sides to this. I was just having this conversation with a friend the other night. Friendships are very interesting because you do have to find that balance of being okay letting friendships go when they're not serving you, when they're sucking your energy, if you're surrounded by a negative person and that really impacts you, like being okay to let those go, but also accepting your friends for who they are and taking lessons from their good qualities and not taking lessons from their not so amazing qualities, if that makes sense. So, you know, if you mm -hmm. have a friend that is super empathetic and she's a very good communicator and she's very nurturing, like learning something from that, but then maybe there's another aspect of her life that she learns from you and you make her better in a certain aspect. Or if you have a friend that um, is really empowering or she is, I'm try like trying to think of examples here, but you know what I mean? <laughs> like she has a really good quality yeah. and you can learn from her, but then there's something about you that she's also benefiting from. So that can also be be like a friendship dynamic of taking the good from your friends and like learning from that, but then also like accepting them for who, because we're all human and like, you're not going to oh, find sure. a friend that is 100% perfect in every single aspect of yes. their life. Um, so I think that's kind of important to remember too. But my next one on my list actually goes hand in hand to what you were saying more on. So like the business or like professional side of this and it's get creative on how you find your mentors. And I think you were talking a lot of kind of like finding that network and meeting people and like getting into the same room as a lot of people. But I think that especially when you're just getting started and whatever you want to do, like maybe you are trying to pursue a business or a different career or whatever it is, that can be really intimidating because it's like, okay, how am I going to get into the same room as these people? And I have to jump on a networking call and that's all very intimidating. But I think this is something that I really prioritized early on in my 20s, just getting creative on how I was going to make myself feel like I was getting into the same room as those people. And the answer is like social media, books, podcasts, like that we're in the age of the internet where there's so many successful people sharing their stories, sharing other people's success stories. And you can get access to all of that information without even knowing the person. So you know, like an author can be your mentor or a podcaster can be your mentor. You can like get access to those stories just by reading, listening to things and in turn get smarter and that person can kind of become your mentor. 100%. I also will say too, I think a lot of people think that people who could be a mentor to you are harder to reach. Granted, if you're trying to like get Mark Cuban to be like your mentor or something, yeah, you're probably not going to get through to him. You know, like he's probably not going to take on like a random person to just like mentor. But I will say, depending on what industry you're interested in, there are a lot of people who genuinely are open to mentoring. I know also my college has like a alumni mentor network where you can meet other alumni. So when I was in college, I would meet with different alumni just to like network with them and just like ask them questions. But you can do it even as an alumni, like you can meet with other alumni as an alumni. So if you've already graduated, <laughs> you you might not miss out on it. Not all colleges obviously have a mentor network, but there's also like Facebook groups usually for alumni. And there's a lot of people in there from, or LinkedIn groups as well. There's people from who've graduated 10 years before you who might be like, you know, in a high position at a company that like you're interested in or that you would love to learn more about that position or whatever it is. And because you have something in common, being alumni from the same college, they're open to talking to you. Literally send them a LinkedIn message. Just send them a message and be like, hey, saw you were a graduate from UConn. Like I'm really interested in sales. Would love to chat with you about it. Like you would be so surprised how many people are actually down to to talk to you and then end up becoming a mentor. But you definitely do have to put yourself out there and use, yeah, use social media platforms to your advantage. Um, I feel like the rest of the ones on my list are more mindset-y or like, I don't know, you'll you'll see when I start explaining, <laughs> you'll get the drift. I feel like this is no surprise because I'm like, my friends and I were playing a card game a couple months ago and I forget what it was called. I think it was called Most Likely To or something like that. But there'd be like a card with a prompt and the group would have to decide 
who's most likely to do that or be that. And there was a card that came up that was like, most likely to discover the meaning of life every day. And my friends were immediately like, <laughs> race. And I was like, stop it right now. I'm just like, I don't know. It's I feel not a like bad I thing. Am, yeah, no, I'm just very, what's the word? Maybe like introspective. I don't know. I'm, <laughs> I'm interesting. Okay, the next one on my list is don't take people's reactions to heart. Um, if something within them was triggered by something you said or did, obviously assuming that the thing you said or did is not malicious or rude, that's just revealing their triggers, which you're not responsible for. This has been something I've learned in the last, I'd probably say six months to a year from getting hate comments online. Um, one of my friends taught me this because when you really think about it, if you're just like, you know, whatever you're walking around the grocery store and someone does something that like makes you like so very upset, like you were triggered by their actions. There might be absolutely no malicious intent, right? Like let's say somebody cuts you off and you're walking down the grocery store. You being upset is like that something within you was triggered by that, right? Or when I post a video, Erin and I were just talking about this before we got on the podcast, started filming. I posted a video about beauty maintenance. I talked about what I like to do to my body, which includes getting Botox and filler. I'm very open about the fact that I get Botox and filler. It's not a secret. If you look at pictures of me from five years ago, you're going to see I had no lips. And if you look at me and you see I have lips today, like (laughs) it's just not a secret. You know what I mean? Like it just, they didn't just poof out of nowhere. Like I don't feel the need to hide it or whatever. Um, And I, it's people were commenting and saying things, you know, like, about how I'm setting unrealistic beauty standards and how like this is the reason why they're not confident. And someone said, someone said, this is the reason why women don't have down payments for houses is because they're spending money on filler. I was like, that is quite the hop, skip and a jump girl from <laughs> what I'm in. Whoa. Um, also, who's to say women don't, women buy, single women buy more homes than men. I believe. Yeah. Um, so I'm like, all right. But it doesn't really like certain comments. Um, impact me when it triggers something within me other comments don't impact me at all because like when i look at those comments i'm like you were something within you was triggered by my video if it made you feel such a way that you had to lash out and i'm not responsible for managing your triggers right nothing in my video was malicious or rude i was talking about me the entire time never said anything about other women um So, you know, but then the flip side of that, right, is like when people comment on my videos, if someone were to comment and be like, you're so mean, I would be like, okay, because like, I know (laughs) I'm not mean, like, I'm not a mean person at all. Um, But I have insecurities, right? And if someone commented and said something about something I'm insecure about, it's only going to bother me if something within me was triggered by it. And so being in a position to acknowledge that, right? Like, ooh, someone just said something and that triggered me. Okay. Something within me was triggered by it. I need to work on managing that trigger or getting rid of that trigger. And this doesn't go for things like like if someone comes up to me and they're just like, you know, they spit in my face, I'm going to be like, hello, like what the heck? You know what I mean? That type of stuff is like, whatever. Yeah. But I feel like it's a good way to think about it. Like if something within you, don't take what people say to heart because it's just a reflection of what's going on inside their internal world and their triggers. Um, And same thing for you. Like if something that someone says really triggers you, that is, that's, uh, you know, what's the word? Like that's Mm -hmm. revealing what your triggers are and where you could work on things. And that mindset has like changed the game for me when it comes to not caring about what people say about me online because we both get a decent bit of hate sometimes on some of our videos, but also it's helped me actually identify points where I'm insecure and work on those things because there were comments people used to make about me that would really bother me, but now I really don't care at all because I feel secure in those things. Yeah. I think the differentiator is it's when someone isn't talking about another person and it still triggers you. You know what I mean? Because this is a lesson that I learned a while ago too. And it is like, it just makes you so much more self-aware to like understand this and then apply it when you see it happening to you. So Mm -hmm. let's use the example of like, you're scrolling through Instagram and a photo pops up of someone getting engaged. Okay. And you might have a little bit of an insecurity that you're not in a relationship. Mm -hmm. If you 
get triggered by seeing that photo, that's a good way to kind of like point out that insecurity and maybe say, okay, I need to work on enjoying my alone time and like understanding how to be alone and all of that. But then let's say the next photo is you see someone having a child and you have no reaction to it. It's like, okay, well, I'm not insecure about the fact that I don't have a child because I don't want a child at this point in my life. Or if you scroll to the next photo and you see someone maybe posting like a workout video or something and it triggers you because you're maybe insecure that you didn't work out that day. You know, that's just kind Mm -hmm. of like how you can apply it to benefit you and give you a little bit more self-awareness around what you potentially might need to work on. Yes. And then the flip side too, being like, if you are the person that posted that video or you in a work environment, if you like put your work out in the group and someone says something or whatever, like, or if someone makes some sort of like snarky comment about something, like if something within them was triggered enough that they commented, like, you know what I mean? Like walk yourself back from what you were just saying and like, be like, okay, they, something within them was feeling insecure, feeling the lack, scarcity, whatever, that they felt so triggered that they had to comment on the video. That's not on me. You know what I mean? Like that is nothing, that is nothing to do with me and everything to do with them. There is a book called The Four Agreements and it's not one of my favorite books. I felt like it was a little bit basic, um, but I've also read a bunch of personal development books. So that's probably why, because they all kind of just like say the same thing after <laughs> a certain point. But um, if this like concept interests you, I would definitely read The Four Agreements because, um, spoiler, it is one of the, this is kind of like one of the agreements is to not take things personally, but he goes like a lot more in depth and it's really interesting to kind of hear that perspective if that's something that you struggle with. Definitely. Okay. So the next one on my list, I really love this one. And this is something that I learned recently. Not that I learned recently, but just like heard it kind of spelled out. And since Mm -hmm. then, I've been trying to apply it a lot in my life. And it honestly helps me so much. So this life lesson is that true happiness comes from spending more time in the present and less time in the past slash future. And like, obviously living in the moment like is kind of a cliche tip but it's not so much that it's more so like enjoying those little monotonous life moments and not constantly thinking of like what's coming next and I used to be so bad at this and I definitely still like have to make a conscious choice every single day to not spend all of my time looking ahead to what's next. Like for example, for the last six to seven weeks, I've been excited to move. And it was really easy for me to spend the last six to seven weeks spending all of my free time looking at furniture I want to buy and like getting excited for all of the places that I'm going to go and looking up like the restaurants that I want to go to when I'm down in Nashville and all of those things. But if I did that, then the last six to seven weeks of my life, I wouldn't have felt true happiness because I wasn't enjoying my life like day to day. And I think the the whole idea with the life lesson in the way that I heard it, I forget where I heard it, maybe like a pod, probably a podcast, um, but was just like the more time in a 24 hour period that you are spending, like not getting excited about what's coming up, not being anxious about something that happened in the past. That is what controls how happy you are day to day. And I I just like love that tip because at the end of the day, most of your life is going to be so monotonous and quote unquote boring. And if you don't love your life in those monotonous, boring moments, then you're not going to be happy. You just reminded me of like, I can't believe I didn't think of it. Well, I mean, I can believe I didn't think of this because it was literally when I was like 16, but I had (laughs) a volleyball coach who told me like a similar thing where I would be at volleyball and I, I was like, I was going through a lot at the time. My mental health was really bad. I had like a million different clubs I was involved in. I just had like health issues going on. Like it was a lot. And I would be at volleyball and he literally came up to me one day and he was just like, I can tell like something's going on. Like he's like, you don't seem okay. And I would be like, well, yeah, like I'm not. Um, And he asked me to stay after practice one day to like, you know, just work like one-on-one on something. But I think it was because he really wanted to like have a conversation with me to help me out. And he would be like, what is like, like at, at, when you're at volleyball, like, why are you so like anxious? I'm like, because I'm thinking about the millions of things I need to do and all the things going on in my life. And something about the way he responded to me, he said, you need to learn to compartmentalize. Like he was like, it is something you'll have to practice over and over and over again. But he was like, learn to like be where your feet are. And I thought that was just like, I don't know, something about him saying to compartmentalize, like was so 
like valuable to me. And a lot of people to this day, like people message me, they'll be, they'll see my to-do list on my story. And they'll be like, how do you get so many things done? And I'm like, because I, I've learned to compartmentalize. Like I can be like, okay, I'm going to focus on this one thing because we lose so much time and energy by thinking about things that yeah, happened in the past or the future, whether it's, yeah, like moving, like I, I'm not able to enjoy just like going out to dinner with my friends here in this city or whatever, spending my last moments in my apartment because my brain is already like trying to get weeks ahead. So just like, yeah, being where your feet are and just like enjoying what is happening right now. It sounds so basic, but it's like made such a difference in my life, especially. Yeah. And it is so hard to do. Like since I've learned yes. this, you once you kind of like hear it spelt out like this, you realize how much time you've spent not doing this. Um, like I know all mm -hmm. throughout college, it was like, okay, I'm in college at RMU, but next semester I'm studying abroad and the entire semester I'm so excited to go to Europe that I don't even enjoy that semester of college. Just things like mm -hmm. that. Once you hear um, this tip, you kind of just realize like how much time you spend not living or not like what, what did you call it living where your feet were <laughs> Be, being, like being where, where your feet, feet are, are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah and um I definitely think like it's a conscious choice you have to make every day but I'm a lot happier when I'm spending my energy just focused on what's going on and just being kind of content and happy um with where I am yeah one thousand percent um the next one on my list is this one i feel like i have to explain a little bit more and i think we talked about this in one of our episodes talking about spirituality a little bit more but it truly has been something that has changed my life especially as someone who struggled with anxiety for the longest time so bear with me while i explain this because i feel like it needs a little bit of explaining but basically the lesson is that everyone has intuition and ego. Intuition is the heart or like your gut feeling. Your ego is driven by logic and is designed to keep us safe. So the thing that really changed my life is that a lot of times people are like, how do I know if it's intuition or ego? Because you'll go to make a decision and all of a sudden this like thought will come to you of like, oh, is this the right decision? And you're like, is that my gut telling me it's the right decision or, or that it's not the right decision? Or is it the part of my brain that's just trying to keep me safe. And like this, if I make this decision and I say yes to this, my life's going to change a lot and my brain just not, you know, ready for that. And what I learned was that if the feeling or the thought comes to you in a moment of peace or calm, it's your intuition. If it comes to you frantically or like all of a sudden, it's your ego. And learning to feel the difference helps immensely in making decisions because I think as a lot of people can agree, trusting your gut is so important, but it's hard to know is like, where is this thought coming to me? And I learned this last year and it it's literally been a game changer. Like when I was looking at apartments and stuff, I had, there was this apartment that I found in Providence, Rhode Island, and it was gorgeous, gorgeous corner unit, floor to ceiling windows, beautiful, open, like high ceiling. Oh my God. It was just, it was stunning. There wasn't anything necessarily wrong with it. I just had this weird, like, it was just like this anxiety about it. And the anxiety wasn't going away. And when I first saw the apartment, I was like, oh my God, I love it. And then I was like, just kind of thinking about it in a moment of just peace. I wasn't, you know, I was in like a neutral state. And I just got this feeling of like, this isn't right. And then I started, the more I thought about it, because I, I went to go like uh, apply, I was like still moving through it, even though I had this gut feeling. And then the feeling of anxiety started to build. And I had to think, I'm like, okay, let me unwind this a little bit. I'm like, the feeling that this wasn't the right move came to me in a moment of peace. I disregarded that and proceeded to move forward with this apartment. And that feeling of this isn't right built up versus when I found the apartment I'm in now, I feel completely at peace. I didn't have any ounce of anxiety about like what this is going to look like. And obviously there will be things and decisions that you make in your life that still are a little bit nerve wracking. Um, but think trying to decipher or figuring out how to know the difference of is this thought intuition or ego is an absolute game changer, especially as someone with anxiety, because it's hard to know well, I don't really have, I don't really struggle with anxiety anymore, but when I did, um, it was hard to know, like, am I, is, is this thought just coming to me because I'm an anxious girly and I overthink everything or is this coming to me because I'm, you know, like this is genuinely not the right decision and this is my gut feeling. Um, so yeah, learning to feel the difference. So like if, if you're someone who like, as I'm saying this, you're like, oh my gosh, I really need to, like, I could work on this just like 
think like when you start to have a doubt or some sort of feeling that you're, you don't know if it's gut feeling or not, try to think about when it came to you and the state you were in when it came to you and how it came to you. Was it like frantic and anxious and all over the place? Or was it like a peaceful, like, Hey, that's not right. You know? Yeah. I feel like I've always, it's so funny. And I know we've talked about this on the podcast before, but Grace and I are total opposites in our decision-making processes because I am the most impulsive person ever. And I don't even want to use the like term impulsive, but when I get an idea, I like have to run with it because I think like that feeling of anxiety for me comes up when I have something that like I'm being called to do and I don't go after it. And I think that comes from me just having a lot of proof that those big decisions work out for me and like that I've grown so much from making big decisions like that. Like honestly, everything in my life that I consider like a big decision I started doing or decided to take the leap on pretty impulsively. Um, So I think at this point in my life, I do just kind of have like maybe a little bit of a naive attitude about it, but kind of just a good attitude of if there's something that I want to do and I'm being called to do, I should just act on it because I like have so much proof of how much I can grow when I listen to that sort of thing. But I'm not very good at after that initial like, okay, I have this idea, like listening to my intuition and being like, okay, is it telling me that like, maybe let's not like, maybe this isn't the right time or like, maybe it's like not, maybe that was just like kind of a rash idea. You know what I mean? I kind of Mm -hmm. jump at everything and (laughs) for better or for worse, but everything's a lesson. So even when things don't work out, you still learn a lot and you still do inevitably grow from it. But I feel like that's kind of the attitude that I always take about the whole trusting your intuition thing, because I agree that's one of the biggest things that has gotten me to where I am today is just being able to trust my intuition and make a big move when I am feeling called to do so. Mm -hmm. Um, The next one on my list, this has to do with the idea of success. And I heard this at some point in 2024. I feel like it was at the beginning of 2024. Um, Someone said, success is on the other side of cringe. And I love this life lesson so much. because it just comes back to the idea that like you're going whatever you want to accomplish if you've never done it before you're not going to be good at it and like everyone who has accomplished something at one point in their life was like a complete newbie at it you know what i mean like yeah. at one point they didn't know what they were doing either but they got started and now they're super successful because of it so like obviously i this kind of like relates for me in the social media sphere like at the beginning of me doing social media my first like 6 months of doing tiktok oh, yeah. i had no idea what i was doing if you go back and listen to those videos they're so bad <laughs> they make me cringe people still like them to this day and it makes me want to die um same thing with the podcast like if you go back and listen to our first 10 episodes of the podcast it will make us cringe like please don't tell Mm -hmm. us that you're going back and listening to our old episodes because it will make (laughs) us cringe but you cannot be successful if you don't get started and if you are waiting until you're like perfect at it to put it out there like at the end of the day it is 2024 no matter what you're trying to do even if you're not trying to get onto social media or be in the public eye everything is pretty public and if you want to accomplish any type of success people are going to know about it and that success is only going to be found on the other side of that cringe and one day it won't feel as cringy so you have to honestly just like take the plunge um i feel like for me this is kind of prevalent in the whole idea of moving away from your hometown. And I used to really take the approach of like, if you want to be successful, you don't have to move away from your hometown. You can stay in your hometown and like accomplish whatever you want to. And you totally can, as long as you're willing to kind of let go of that fear of judgment and embrace that cringe when you feel like all of the eyes are on you, because that is the big benefit of moving away and feeling like you don't no one knows you and you can do everything like without the public eye watching for the most part Um, but if you're willing to embrace the cringe and let go of that fear of judgment you don't have to move away from your hometown in order to be successful but that's sort of like the thought process there yeah even just trying new things like i remember when i was in um i lived in los angeles for a month last year with a friend of mine and 
we just like worked and lived there for a month. It was really fun. We went to a trapeze class, which if you don't know what trapeze is, like when you go to a circus, you see the people flying through the air, like on the bar, that's what trapeze is. And we did a couple trapeze classes. Fun fact about me is I don't really like heights. You got to climb up a ladder and then jump <laughs> oh off a ledge. So like, and hang on to this pole and like do flips and whatnot. And like, I was literally at the top of the thing. My kneecaps are shaking violently. I'm literally gripping onto it for dear life. I'm like so terrified. It's embarrassing. I'm in this class. Well, it's not embarrassing because I'm going to share something in a second, but <laughs> it was like awkward. Like I'm like, oh my God, this feels so out of my comfort zone. I'm in this class. It's like a group class with like these like nine-year-old girls who they're cheering me on because they literally go to this class all the time. They're like doing flips <laughs> they're and like tricks and whatnot. <laughs> and I'm up there at my big age, like freaking out over it. But the thing is, is if I let the cringe or embarrassment get to me, I would have never done it. And there was a creator who says embarrassment is a waste of an emotion. And I can't remember her name. She's the one who made the at-home laundry detergent. You, I oh, don't even yeah, know her yeah. name. Sarah. Yes. Sarah yes, Boss. Sarah. Yes, yeah, Sarah Boss. I was like blanking on her name. I kept trying to think of it as you we were talking, but um, I'm pretty sure it was her in her video once. She was like, embarrassment is a waste of an emotion. And I was like, I love that. That is so true. And I think the creator who said that cringe um or like su successes on the other side of cringe i think it was tessa this girl tessa yeah. i can't remember her last we'll, name we'll link but both of these her name's tess barclay we'll link tess, both of yeah. these creators in the show notes yeah. yeah they're both awesome they both make really incredible content but it's like i i heard um the embarrassment is a waste of an emotion which i feel like is so similar um and that was that was really eye-opening yes because <laughs> everyone's embarrassing in the beginning like everyone is you know what i mean i don't know um okay Next one on my list is how happy you are is highly dependent of highly dependent on how in control of your life you feel. Um, I'm pretty sure the book Psychology of Money is the book that I got this from, and he talks about the impact of control, how in control of our lives we feel, and the impact it has on happiness. Um, so admit where you feel out of control and take action to find solutions. It's probably going to be tough. It's probably going to be messy, and it might even be expensive, but it's worth it. Um, I, for a very long time, would kind of feel like certain aspects of my life were a little bit out of control, especially as it pertains to my health, which I've talked about in other podcast episodes, very long 10-year health journey going from all these different specialists and whatever. And I had wanted to, I'm like, I just want to get to the root of this. And it was just, I, I felt like my life was out of control because um, I would be like, oh, I feel this way, but there's no answer as to why I feel that way. Um, and last year I decided to actually take action to start getting certain things in control. So I like went to the functional medicine doctor. It was definitely expensive. I had to save for it for like six months before I could actually afford to go, but it completely changed my life. Same with money. Like this was my approach to money. I was like, I feel like things are a little out of control. I'm not like budgeting, whatever. Was it tough initially to like get a budget in place and actually follow through with it every week and what yeah of course it's a brand new habit there's going to be resistance it's going to take time for it to become a habit and to become part of your life but knowing that how in control of our lives we feel is such a major factor in how happy we feel it's like if you can just get these aspects of your life in control you will feel so much happier Definitely. And I think that goes into my, well, it's going to be my last one because we're about to run out of time. Um, we didn't get to all of these. So we're going to make, we're going to make a part two and finish the rest of our 25 things that we learned by 25. Um, but the last thing that I'm going to mention on my list is kind of go hand, kind of goes hand in hand with that. And it's just that money is only an important resource because it helps you buy back your time. And I feel like this is a good one to end on since this is the Girls Talk Money podcast. Um, but we talk about this concept a lot because money is obviously important for a lot of reasons, but it can be hard to kind of like take a bird's eye view and like look at the big picture of why money plays a big role in your life. And it helps you get more in control of your time. And at the end of the day, like we said in a couple of these other lessons, like time is your most valuable resource and it's the one resource that you really like can't get more of and money is the one thing that can help you buy back more of that time i know i learned this like pretty early on in my 20s i was still in college and i was starting my first full-time job and i just realized how much time i was going to be giving up to 
an employer. I started my first full-time job. I absolutely hated it. And I was like, I'm going to be working here for the rest of my life because I'm not going to be able to afford to not work here for the rest of my life. Um, and it was just kind of like a hard pill to swallow as a 20, 22 year old at the time that I was going to be giving up so much of my adulthood to something that I hated so much. Um, so just kind of remembering that like that is the role that money plays in your life is to help you feel more in control of your time because the more you have your financial shit together, the more you can build something for yourself financially, the more in control of your time you'll be. And I think like it's important to know on this topic as well that it's really easy to kind of lose sight of this and get caught up in financial goals that are strictly numeric. But we talk about this a lot on the podcast that those are really only vanity metrics at the end of the day. And what I mean by this is if you're sitting here being like, well, I really want to save six figures or I really want to make my net worth a million dollars by the time I'm 40 years old. It's like, okay, yes, but you need to remember the why behind that. Like, what is that money going to do for you? And if you're not setting your financial goals in a way that helps you gain more time freedom, then money isn't really serving a purpose in your life. Mm -hmm. 100%. I, we were just talking about this too. I feel like about the whole, I think it was a private conversation. I was Erin and I talk all the time. So sometimes <laughs> I'm like, did we talk about this in the podcast or did we just talk about this because we're friends? Um, but I, I was thinking about it when it came to like the net worth thing where you see these like people who are like, here's what I do in a day as a 26 year old with a 500K net worth. And I'm like, what, what is, okay. Like, I, what is that? That's really awesome. That's like, congratulations. You know what I mean? But that doesn't mean that you have to go and like emulate that if that doesn't actually excite you or feel like you're actually it is not if that's not contributing to the life that you actually want you know what I mean like you don't have to run yourself into the ground to hit some of these like vanity metrics that are ultimately just arbitrary numbers that are not driving like you don't even there should be a reason behind like everything so if you're like okay I want to reach a 500k net worth by a certain age okay yeah what is like the actual reason behind wanting to do that because if there's really no reason or purpose for that achievement then like yeah why like why are yeah. you why are you doing it <laughs> yeah definitely well i think that wraps up today's episode of the girls talk money podcast if you have any life lessons that you've learned so far in your 20s or at any point if you're older than your mid to late 20s that's okay too um please leave them in spotify we can maybe like shout some out in part two of this episode um, because these are fun episodes to go through and we hope you guys like them. But leave all questions, feedback in Spotify. And as always, you can DM us on Instagram at Girls Talk Money Pod as well. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of the Girls Talk Money Podcast.